Hello, everyone, and thank you, Hara, for that introduction. My name is Dan Dardani. Uh, I'm thrilled to be with you all today, this afternoon, Monday, uh, wherever you happen to be tuning in. I uh, This is a talk I've given at MIT uh, in various forms over the years, but this is the first year that um, I am joined by my uh, work colleagues at Duke University, uh, in particular colleagues at the Duke's Office of Translation and Commercialization, my new home. Uh, and so this is a lecture that is um, kind of combining two great universities and two great learning forces, Duke and MIT, as well as some of you tuning in from the general public. So wherever you happen to be watching from, I thank you for tuning in. Today, we're gonna to have a little bit of fun. We're gonna learn a little bit about copyrights. We're gonna talk about history. We're gonna talk about philosophy. We're gonna talk a little bit about tech and data and software IP, all fun stuff. And I hope we'll have time at the end for some questions. I would appreciate it if you keep your, um, for the most part, your screens muted. And if you do have something you'd like to say or a comment, put it in the chat and we have folks kind of monitoring the chat and we'll make sure we have time to get to it. So with that, there are four basic types of intellectual property. Um, and you're probably familiar with many of them. Patents, of course, cover inventions and in innovations and technologies. Uh, trademarks cover advertising and logos um, and things we essentially put into commerce. Trade secrets cover um, protected business information, strategic business information that uh, affords its holder some uh, benefit and therefore it's in its best interest to keep it secret. But today we're talking about copyrights. And I think copyrights is one of the most uh, easy pieces of IP to have a handle on because it's the most closest hand, right? We, we know copyrights, we're familiar with copyrights. We deal with copyrights all day long. You've probably interfaced with dozens of copyrights already today, even if you're not cognizant of it. Copyrights represent works of authorship. These are things that we read. These are the movies that we see. These are the songs and music that we listen to. So basically content, works of authorship that get fixed in a medium of expression are subject to copyrights. So it's a piece of intellectual property that doesn't require an advanced degree in science to understand. You don't have to sort of be a marketing guru or go to law school to really get a handle on copyrights. So it makes it both fun, but also a challenge. So let's start. I always like to start this talk with this picture. Um, and it's because even though we think of intellectual property as being a uniquely sort of modern enterprise, you know, it's always in concerning what's the cutting edge of technology, you know, what's just on the horizon or beyond the horizon in terms of commerce, in terms of the economy, um, it really pays to take a pause and look backward and understand what's the legacy of intellectual property that has brought us to today. And the story of intellectual property is as old as the founding of our nation itself. Uh, and so it's, it's always fun to kind of think back about its roots and see how it's evolved to the point where we are inheriting it today. So here we have you know, a picture of our founding fathers, there's Adams and there's Jefferson and Franklin. Uh, I'm sure Madison and Monroe are somewhere in there. And these were the folks who really thought long and hard about intellectual property law in the United States and were the framers of the seminal pieces of legislation that essentially bequeathed us the current IP system that we have. But of course, like all good things in America, we borrowed a lot of this from the mother country, from England. So the real story of intellectual, prop, of intellectual property of copyrights in particular goes even farther back in time to the UK. Uh, and you can argue it's the first evidence of copying. We copied our law from England's law. And so in the 1500s, a copyright law appears in print in the UK by royal decree. Curiously though, it's very different than our current thoughts on copyright because the rights are granted to the stationer, to the printing company, to the company that actually makes and sells and prints the books. Put yourself in this time frame. it's the 1500s. Gutenberg's 
uh, movable type printing press has only been around 100 years or so or less. And so books is a big thing, right? And you don't just have everyone having access to books. They're a spe special guild, they're a special class. And the people that make books um, are a big deal. And so this new technology at the time was seen as something kind of, uh, you know, not just for the everyday person. And so the first law on the books gives all the rights in what's being printed to the people who are actually making and selling the books. It also allows the sovereign, the king or queen, to dole out these monopolies to these companies, particularly as favors. So it allows the king and queen to kind of control what exactly is being said in these books. Because if you're doling out these monopolies to companies that are in your court or courtesans in your favor, you're obviously going to encourage people who say nice things about you and not give monopolies to people that are going to say critical things about you or your administration. So it also becomes a very effective way of controlling and of censoring information and culture in the early days of its founding. Fast forward a couple hundred years, and in 1710, we get the Statute of Anne, which is the picture on the right. And this is now kind of a little bit more of a modern looking copyright law. It kind of mirrors essentially what's on the books today for a copyright law. And here, rightly, the rights now are switched from the printers or the stationers back to the authors, to the creators of the works. It also requires you, if you're interested in getting a copyright uh, uh, officially through the government, to submit a copy of your manuscript so that it could be evaluated and archived. And so these are how people built their libraries. In fact, it's still uh, curious to know that if you want to apply for a copyright today, you are actually requested to send a copy of your material to the Library of Congress. That's the library that kind of works side by side with the Copyright Office. And so it's still an effective way to build a national archives by making sure everyone that wants to copyright something has to send a copy of it in. But let's get back to the future. So now we're in 1789, the ratification of our constitution. And here we have a somewhat innocuous sentence um, in the constitution and notice where it is. It's in article one, section eight, clause eight. So pretty, pretty good standing. It's in the first article of the constitution. It's not buried in a footnote and it's not on the last page in the fine print, it's right up there at the top. So Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8, to promote the progress of the science and the useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive rights to their respective writings and discoveries. That's it. This one seemingly simple innocuous statement creates all intellectual property in the United States, henceforth. This is the birthing of all patents, of all copyrights, and later on, you can argue trademarks uh, through the Lanham Act and other types of clauses where through uh, interstate commerce, things get tied into the federal government as opposed to state government. So so why does this all matter? And why, why are we talking about this today? Well, I think it's pretty fascinating because for me, intellectual property has this ever-present challenge. And the challenge is to set the fulcrum point that strives a perfect balance for wanting to promote and incentivize the creations of works, the creations of inventions, the creations of things that benefit society, but also kind of protect the individual's rights at the same time. And it's this interplay, this tug of war between the protection for the individual at the same time, sort of to promote and progress the sort of collective society, capital S, that makes it extremely interesting, extremely difficult to do. Because you can argue that favoring one side versus the other kind of creates havoc. Uh, and, and to me, this is why intellectual property remains such a fascinating subject and sort of bleeds over into the law, into the courts, into academia, um, into the commerce, into business, into you name it, intellectual property is going to have a say because it's it's constantly like water seeking sort of these areas to fill in the space. 
but ultimately trying to understand what is the right recipe, what is the right ingredients to kind of foster the type of society we want, one that values the individual's rights to create and, and protect those rights for the individual, but at the same time, not at the expense of taking things away from the collective commons and the rights of everybody else to enjoy or otherwise reuse and repurpose those very same things. Um, and so to me, this is what makes the topic fascinating. Uh, this is why it is constantly a form of our government and why it ebbs and flows depending upon which administration's in charge and sort of what's happening with the overall macroscopic economy uh, and lots of other variables that affect us. But let's talk a little bit about its philosophical roots because I think it helps. So in the old days, sort of originally, you can think of intellectual property, particularly copyrights, as being akin to kind of the sacred right between a mother and child. It was very personal, right? And what we think of is just like in theology where the rights of the word of scripture was considered sacred, almost magical, actually even almost divine. And just by talking the words, the name of God or what the God had put in scripture what had a power over sort of you know, making these things so in, in the physical world. And it was that same magic, that same divinity between sort of the word and the actual thing that kind of gets blurred into copyright. So here we have this quote from this uh, attorney, Simon Marion, who lived in the 1500s. And here he is pleading before essentially the Supreme Court of his day in Paris. And I think he was talking about the works of Seneca or Cicero or someone um, and how they should be kind of dealt with in some books at the time. And he goes, just as the heavens and the earth belong to God because they are the works of his word, capital W, the author of a book is its complete master and as such can dispose of it as he or she chooses. And so here again, they're, they're kind of equating the author with God and with God's creation, the world and all everything else that goes along with it with sort of what a person can do when they sit down and think about how to create something, whether it's uh, some piece of writing, literature, maybe some song, some music. It's a very private, it's a very personal bond, like mother and child, and no one should get in between that. And this is sort of the philosophical underpinning of that starts the movement, but it doesn't end there because we see a shifting in the philosophical roots a few hundred years later from the individual to the utilitarian point of view. And it's largely influenced by this guy. This guy is John Locke. And John Locke's a famous, um, uh, famous sort of voice of reason in his age, influenced many influential thinkers as well. But John Locke had sort of a unique view of property. And in the Lockean view of property, if you did something to property that was otherwise unattended to or unclaimed for, it was your act of um, work, your act of effort that bestowed a property right into the final outcome. So this is sometimes called the sweat of the brow doctrine. If you sort of put some sweat equity into building something, you can make an argument that you now have control property interest in that very thing. Now, if you think about it, this makes sense at the time, you know, we're living in the age of exploration, there's a new world, colonization is happening all across the globe, and people are showing up in places, you know, somewhat conveniently ignoring the indigenous population and claiming that, you know, they are uh, taking over these lands because they're adding all of this sweat equity to it, you know, raising farms out of untilled soil and building and putting livestock in places where they weren't before and sort of assuming control, assuming property of it as a result. So they rely on Locke's ideas a lot. But it's this utilitarian view that kind of really brings this forward. So for the Star Trek geeks in the room, remember, the goods of the many outweigh the, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few or the one. That's a utilitarian philosophy. So what matters is not you as an individual, but you in relationship to how we incentivize the public, the common, the collective. And so now we see this changing in, it's not so much because 
you create a work and you're like its parent, it's more you create a work and the benefit is outward facing to the public because we get to read that work and we get inspired by that song and it creates other new works and the library grows and grows in more volumes of, of wonderful creations, right? You create a technology, you seek to patent it, someone else can read that patent, get inspired by it, look to improve it, and therefore in a teleological fashion, you know, technology is improved because now we've got people trying to build better mousetraps one after the other. And so that benefit always comes back to society, to the public, to the country, even though we're indirectly incentivizing the individual through this monopoly and allowing them to sort of profit from their uh, intellectual labor. So um, it's the benefit to the useful arts, remember, to promote the progress of science and the useful arts, that means like industry, um, that we want to encourage and incentivize copyright. So there's this de-emphasis on the individual or the moral right. Moral rights still exist in Europe um, with art, for example. But in the United States, it really becomes more about what matters to the country, what matters to society. And that still governs the philosophy behind how courts look at IP issues to this day. So it's not uncommon that some of the most important pieces of copyright at this time are going to be things that are seen as practical and useful to the industries of the day. So maps and charts are some of the most uh, important pieces of early copyright. And so it makes sense. Remember, age of exploration, you're trying to um, settle the new world. And, you know, they didn't have satellite technology at the time. And so someone's maps or charts or someone who scouted a particular area and can report back for the next expedition that's returning to farm or colonize is going to be really valuable. So if you're heading back to the Chesapeake Bay area, uh, and you want to sort of check out all the Potomac River estuaries, having this map could be useful, especially if you want to avoid that tree-eating bear thingy up in the top left-hand corner. So uh, you can understand how these were the very important uh, private possessions of uh, early copyright holders. So with that as kind of background into some of the historical and philosophical ideas, let's jump into the nuts and bolts. So here's the definition. Copyright subsists, that is to say it exists, in any original work of authorship, fixed in a tangible medium of expression. Now I want to, I'm going to argue that this is an equation. And we've got a lot of folks from MIT and Duke listening in, so we're okay with equations. It's not that hard, right? This equation is pretty easy. It has three elements. If something is original, if it's a work of authorship, and if it's fixed in a tangible medium, then I'm going to argue it's a copyright. So let's commit this to memory. If you ever wonder, hey, is this a copyright or is this not a copyright? Ask yourself, does it fit the equation? Is it original? Is it a work of authorship? And we'll understand what that means in a second. Is it fixed in a tangible medium of expression? And if those three elements exist, I'm going to argue you do have a copyright, barring some like, you know, it was put into the public domain, ran out of copyright, or someone sort of disavowed it. Okay, we have a copyright. So what? What does that a copyright get you at the end of the day? Well, Congress says you, as an exclusive copyright holder, you have some rights. And these rights include the rights to make a copy, the rights to reproduce it. It's called the copyright after all. You also have the important rights to prepare a derivative work, that is to build upon your work, make it better, make it stronger, change it, and so a derivative work is a new copyright that obviously is derived from the original work. And an easy example of a derivative work is if you write a novel and someone wants to turn that novel into a movie, well, the screenplay or the movie is a derivative work of the novel. It's not the same thing, right? A screenplay uh, is a much shorter document than the novel, most likely. Um, and the movie is going to make some, you know, artistic decisions along the way to how to represent the ideas in the book in a more succinct fashion. And so you are allowing someone to create a new work that's derived from the original work. And it would not make sense if, you know, a stranger could potentially prepare a derivative work on top of a work that you originally produced. 
in, you know, you think about the situation where you write a book and then someone else would get the chance to make the movie and then a third party could actually make the sequel to the movie. It would be everyone trying to leapfrog each other. It'd be crazy chaos. So in this case, all of the rights start with the copyright holder. They can be bought or sold or licensed just like any other property. And that's the very complex world of Hollywood movie making, which we're not going to talk about. But nonetheless, it all stems back to the fact that Congress says the copyright holder and only the copyright holder can create future derivative works. They also have the rights to distribute by sale, transfer, ownership, rental, lease, lending, meaning to make money off of their copyright. They also have the ability to perform their copyright publicly or to display their copyright publicly. And that makes a lot more sense when you understand that works of copyright include things like dance and things like paintings, where having them in your home where no one can see them is not enough. All right, what's the duration of a copyright? Life of the author plus 70 years. It's a very long term of copyright, much longer than a patent. A patent only lasts 20 years from a date of filing. So it's uh, you know, relatively quick compared to the duration of a copyright. There's a story behind how copyright got to be so long in the tooth. Um, didn't always start out that way. In fact, the original term of copyright was only 14 years. It was two indentured servitudes, later to be sort of added an additional 14 years for the grand sum of 28 years of lifetime. But over the years, it's been slowly added to and increased to where it currently is now by law, life of an author plus 70 years. So let's think about this. If you were to write a novel or publish your novel, let's say later today after this talk, and then on your way home, you get into a tragic car accident and die unexpectedly, the copyright in that book you just published wouldn't expire to the year 2093, to an additional 70 years of life. And of course, if you go on to live a much longer life and you don't die in that car accident prematurely, you get all of the added years of your lifespan on top of that. So it's a very, very long term of copyright. Now, what happens if you are not a person? What happens if your copyright belongs to a corporation like MIT or Duke University or Microsoft or Google? or if you do a work made for hire as um, a freelancer, or if you're an anonymous author and you pen your poems without letting anyone know who you are, how are they gonna know when you die if they don't know who you are? So there's a different clock to decide these types of copyrights, 95 years from publication or 120 years from creation, whichever comes first. And the reason why there's two different choices here is because not every work has to be published. You could write the great American novel and leave it in your bedside drawer for the rest of your life and never bring it to a publisher. So in which case, if it's never published, how do you know when the clock starts? Well, we know now. The clock starts when you create it. And 120 years later, if it's not published, it will fall out of copyright. Now there's this cute little uh, sort of Sonny Bono Copyright Term Extension Act. It's actually an old, old law now, but back in the 90s when it was first uh, put forth, it added 20 years of copyright to all copyrights automatically. It used to be life plus 50. And then after 1998, it became life plus 70. And it was in part because, as many argued somewhat um, correctly, uh, Steamboat Willie was going to come out of copyright that year and Disney lobbied to make sure Steamboat Willie would not come out of copyright. So Lots of uh, Congress decided to act and add 20 years of life to all copyrights. And the long and short of it was that nothing entered into the public domain from 1998 for another 20 years. So uh, works finally started to go back into the public domain around 2019. There are some Charlie Chaplin movies and some other things that are now uh, part of the public domain as a result of the Sonny Bono Copyright Term Extension, that kind of. Um, fading out. So in general, any work that's kind of older than 1926, it's fairly safe to say it's in the public domain and there are no longer rights associated with it. All right. So now let's, can, let's clear, clarify a few things which are often misrepresented about copyright. The first thing you need to know is that the rights are created upon fixation. There's no need 
to apply for a copyright. You can register your copyright and there is a good reason to do that, but it's not required. Unlike a patent where you do not have a patent until the government formally issues you or grants your patent. Um, you don't have a patent just because you wrote a patent application one night. You do have a copyright because you happen to create a work of authorship that's fixed in a tangible medium. So what this means, those of you, some of you might be out there writing notes about what uh, this presentation is covering. The notes that you're writing are gonna be copyrights because they're original to you. And you're not creating a transcript of what I'm saying and you're fixing them in some medium, maybe pad on paper, maybe typing it into your laptop, um, affixing it to a, a hard drive or some kind of memory whether electronic or otherwise, um, and that represents a copyright. So you have a copyright. You don't need to then request one from the Library of Congress, but you can. Uh, you don't need to see with a circle around it in order for your copyright to be valid, even though you'll still see that oftentimes. Uh, if you open up the jacket of a book, you'll often see the C with the circle uh, next to the publisher's name. And that's just a formality. Some people like putting people on notice, but it's not necessary. You can register your copyright. It costs about $65. You send it off to the copyright office with some other questions answered, and eventually you'll get a registration number come back. Uh, the reason why you're going to register your copyright is because it's required if you want to sue somebody over your copyright. And that could be a big deal, particularly if you are a publisher printing thousands of books of, I don't know, a Prince Harry's um, latest autobiographical uh, diatribe you know, you want that protected because people might be infringing that copyright and you might need to enforce it. So they're going to register that book and make sure it's all efficient. But the notes that you're writing about my uh, little copyright lecture need not be. And many universities um, do not bother to register the copyrights in their copyrighted, let's say, software or other things for that very reason. But if you wanted to put a sample notice on your copyright, you're free to. I've given you an example here in the notes. It's simply a copyright. You can spell it out or you can put a C with a circle around it. The year that the work was created, um, your name or the name of the copyright holder to be more precise. And then usually a statement that says something like all rights reserved. Um, meaning that if you wanna do any of the uh, um, rights that Congress gives the copyright holder, you should talk to the copyright holder. If you wanna make a derivative, talk to the copyright holder. If you wanna distribute it or license it, talk to the copyright holder. Um, there's some variants of this, which we'll talk about later. You can do like some rights reserved, things like that, but that's generally it. So now let's figure out what, what, what are works of authorship? I've been throwing that around a lot, but let's now actually unpack what that means. Well, works of authorship are listed here. This is what the statute actually says are works of authorship. But I want you to understand that this list is meant to be inclusive um, and, and not sort of um, uh, exclusive. So when we say literary works, what they really mean are works that can be um, printed, works that can be written down, not literature in the grand sense of the word, like only Shakespeare can have a copyright because he is a true literature creator. No. Uh, even mundane works like the notes that you're jotting down on a legal pad are literature in this sense of the word. Software code, like uh, source code, um, that's considered literature in this context. It's just when, when we actually put words to paper and hopefully make something that is expressive and not just functional, that's going to cover number one. And number two covers the entire world of music. And so we're talking composition, like what Beethoven or Mozart might do when they sat down to compose, um, as well as lyrics, as well as all of the other things that go into any type of, uh, you know, musical onion work, as I like to call it. So that covers all of the world of music. Three, obviously, for dramatic works. So Broadway and plays and all kinds of things related to uh, theatrical works are covered under three. Four covers the world of movement, uh, choreography and dance and pantomimes, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Five covers the entire world of art, uh, whether you're taking a photograph as an artist, whether you are a painter, whether you are a uh, sketch artist that works primarily in pencil, um, exclusively as a sculptor or modern or classical or whatever you name it, 
Number five covers the entire T-sphere of art that is expressive. Six, movies, audiovisual works, motion pictures. Seven, things that can be recorded via sound, particularly music. Like when you take the composition from number two and the lyrics from number two, and you go into a sound studio to produce a master recording that's going to be distributed via, I'm going to show my age here, CD, as opposed to, I guess now it'd be streaming, um, that's going to be covered under seven, the sound recording. Eight, architectural works. And by architectural works, we mean both blueprints, which kind of makes sense because you can kind of see, write down and roll up a blueprint, but also the actual architectural work itself. So for those of you familiar with MIT's campus, you have this data center, um, which is a you know, really interesting piece of architecture. That building itself is actually protected um, as a um, copyrighted work. Things that are not protected. This list is equally important. And it's because it, it really talks to the heart of what a copyright is and what a copyright isn't. So things that are never protected under copyright are facts. And I have that in bold because that's a very important concept because a fact is not expressive and a fact therefore cannot be owned by any one individual. So the fact that it's, you know, whatever the temperature is right now, you know, where I am, you know, it's cold. So it's like 30 something degrees. That's a fact. And if I write that today is Monday, January 23rd, and it's 37 degrees um, outside where I'm talking to you from in near Boston, that is a fact. That's not an expression. I haven't added anything expressive in there. So therefore I have no rights to own that statement, nor does anybody else. And this is why um, when you watch the news or when you read a newspaper, they're chock full of facts. And for the most part, no, no newspaper is going to accuse another newspaper of infringing its story simply because they are regurgitating a bunch of similar facts about current events. Ideas likely are also not protected under copyright. If I want to have this wonderful idea of how to improve MRI technology, I can't write that down in an article or in a book and claim that I now own that technology or that idea because I wrote it down in a book and therefore have a copyright on it. That's not how copyright works. So if I want to own on something akin to the expression of that idea, I can go talk to the patent office and maybe file a patent on my new MRI technology, but I cannot own the concept or own the idea. Nobody owns ideas. Ideas like facts are free to trade in. I can't say, stop thinking about that idea in your head. It's mine, um, just not possible. Titles, procedures, methods of operation, principles, discoveries, functional items, all of these things don't compute into copyright and therefore they, not the right mechanism for trying to protect these things. Processes and procedures and methods, great fodder for patents. And you can go there and work on trying to get those things protected there. Just don't come to the Copyright Office trying to get them. Now, curiously, any work of the US government is automatically in the public domain. That's by rule. So just know that. If you want to sort of pinch something that's produced by a report by the NIH or the FBI or the state um, the office of um, the Department of State, you're free to do so because those white papers or those things that they publish are entirely public domain documents because no United States government personnel, employee, or office can own a copyright. Now you might say, hey, wait a minute, Dan. We universities get funded by the government all the time, like to produce all kinds of stuff, journals, publications, even technologies. But you know, what about that? Well, that's different because then the government is just acting as a funder and they're giving it over to a contractor, in this case, the contractor being the university, the professor, the PI to do that work. And in which case then it's the contractor that's gonna be able to own that output, that intellectual property, barring some other sort of prearrangement. And so if the government pays for a think tank to produce a white paper on the status of peace in the Middle East, that think tank's work will be protected under copyright, presumably, if they're a private entity and non, you know, nonprofit, as opposed to if the State Department put that out directly. 
All right, let's give an example. Why are titles not protected under copyright? Here we have a bunch of real books written about Abraham Lincoln. Now let's suppose the first author biography of Abraham Lincoln, the author decided to um, call that book Abraham Lincoln. All right, makes sense. Are we then going to say that every other biographer of Lincoln that has ever graced the culture thereafter would have to come up with a different title than Abraham Lincoln or Lincoln or some variant therefrom of just because someone was first to thinking about the very clever and creative title Abraham Lincoln? Of course not. Titles and in short phrases in and of themselves do not could, uh, allow themselves to be monopolized by any one person or persons. They are not ownable. So every other person that's ever written a book about Abraham Lincoln can pretty much call their book Abraham Lincoln, and there's no violation of copyright whatsoever, at least not in the title. It would be kind of ridiculous. Uh, think of all the circumlocution you would need uh, when people would kind of arrive at a title to have to then force everyone else to express their similar topic in a different way. Like, you know, your book would have to be called The 16th President of the United States. And then no one else could ever use that as a title. And you have to come up with yet another way of figuring out how to describe Lincoln. So another author might say, you know, the guy who got shot at Ford's Theater, um, that sort of thing. So we don't want to, we don't want to encourage that silliness, that nonsense. So titles are not protected under copyright. Okay, now let's talk about who owns a copyright. So if you are the sole creator of a copyright, then you are its sole author and initially its sole owner. So working by yourself and you write the great American novel on your own, you are its author and you are its owner. Now ownership is always subject to employment or any other type of assignment obligations. So for example, if you are hired to do a job and one of the things you sign on day one of your job is that if you invent or come up with any copyrights or other intellectual property in the context of your employment, then your employer is the owner of those works. And that makes sense. So in this case, even though you might be the author, you are not necessarily the owner. There is this sort of distinction there between authorship and ownership. And an employer who's agreed to give you a salary in exchange for understanding your expertise in a particular area may have the um, possessive, uh, may take possession of your works in that sense. Likewise, you can also voluntarily assign your works through an assignment, which is essentially a legal transfer of ownership. And that is often the case for copyrights as well. If you are a freelance, person and you happen to agree to take employment temporarily, like under a work for hire, then someone is paying you some money in exchange for some product or output, then likewise, there could be a transfer of ownership of the intellectual property in the work that you were hired to do. So sole authorship always is going to be at the expense of whether you have some you know, underlying employment or assignment obligation or work for hire agreement. Just understand that. This is a very familiar concept for those of us in the workforce um, who routinely sign away these things. But if you are sort of a private citizen, not employed by anyone, then it's likely that you would be the sole owner of your copyrighted work uh, as an author. Now, there is a possibility to jointly create a copyright. And that's when two or more people decide to sort of work on a work of authorship. And in those situations, there needs to be the intention to fuse each person's contribution into sort of an inseparable whole. So what I mean by that is if two people kind of uh, collaborate on a work, let's say they're writing a, an article, um, you know, it's not so much that they say, okay, I'll write page one through five and you write page six through whatever it takes to finish it. I'll only own the copyright in page one through five and you own all the copyright in page six through whatever. No. What we mean by this is that regardless of who does what or how, you know, you're going to be collaborating, you're going to be sharing ideas, you're going to be thinking about the work as a whole, even if you're not necessarily contributing to the work in equal um, capacities or, or sort of, you know, taking different times and turns at it. But it's the intention, and this is where intention matters, to have their contributions fused that makes it a joint work. 
in which case e each party's name goes on the top and each party has essentially an undivided 100% stake in the ownership of that work. Now there could be agreements to the other that says, no, we're going to share it and this is how we're gonna share it or break it down. You could also have piecewise ownership of a work. This might make sense, for example, if you're building a piece of software where each party will contribute a feature or module as it grows. Think of open source software that sort of grows organically over time. In this case, there's not an intention up front for the parties to work together, but there's gonna be contributions made by people with permission, in which case those contributions will each be owned by their individual creators or authors. So you'll know, hopefully, because this feature was done by uh, MIT, the feature below it was written by Duke, the feature below that was written by Stanford, that sort of thing. Now I have a picture here of a famous Naruto macaw monkey. And the reason is because, believe it or not, Naruto's copyright ownership case plagued our legal system for the better part of a decade. And it's a fun little story that highlights some of the uh, shortcomings of our legal system. Um, so Naruto was, you know, doing what he does, which is sort of just be a monkey and walk around um, in the wildlife preserve. A photographer was happened to be photographing a bunch of uh, wildlife in his park that day, set up a camera um, and had sort of one of those remote push button, take a picture kind of things. And I don't know, walked away to his truck to get a sandwich or I don't know, to pick up a wrench. And Naruto, kind of curious, came over to the rig, picked up the button and pushed it and snapped this perfect selfie of himself, right? So picture became very famous. People wanted to buy it. They thought it was clever. Um, looks like Naruto was taking a selfie on purpose. Who knows? Maybe he was. We, I, I don't know his, his mind. But um, nonetheless, there was a lot of interest, commercial interest in this photograph. Who owned the photograph? Who was going to get the royalties? For the sale of this photograph. Of course, the photographer said, it's mine, 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 and all mine. It's my camera. I was there to photograph everyone that day, and I own all the output of the photographs that come out of that. Makes sense, because the law does say that if you're a photographer, you're the author, you're pushing the button, you know, you are going to own the copyright in the photograph that results from, you know, your setup and, and you being the sort of principal agent behind the photograph. Problem is, he wasn't. Naruto was. Naruto pushed the button. So you can set up the apparatus and you can sort of make it very easy, but you, if you don't actually push the button, then what? So does Naruto then own the photograph? Is he the copyright holder? In which case, that creates a whole set of other legal issues. How does a non-human own property? Who? How does a non-human um, collect a royalty? How does a non-human you know, get to decide whether the zoo as the owner of the monkey should benefit from the royalties that the calendars are bringing in and all that stuff, right? It's kind of a mess. So PETA takes up the case on behalf of the monkey, to argue that, you know, Naruto should really be the owner of this and get all the benefits of this. Um, and obviously the photographer feels otherwise. This goes through various levels of our legal system um, all the way up and down um, from district court to Supreme Court uh, to higher level district courts um, and eventually gets settled. And it was a tragic loss for Naruto because ultimately the ruling was, you know, all, Congress wrote all of our laws for people. And the laws that talk about what the rights and the copyright holder are and what a copyright is are necessarily for people, not for apes or at least not for non-human apes. Um, and so unfortunately, even though Naruto had as good of a case as any, he lost his case because it was ruled that a non-human or a non-person could not necessarily hold a copyright. By the way, this is foreshadowing for artificial intelligence, um, which we'll talk about later, but non-human cannot own intellectual property. So for those of you in the audience wondering, well, what happens when AI gets smart enough to create copyrights, who's going to own it? And this is the same question that Naruto was tugging at. Um, but anyway, Naruto didn't win his case. But it turns out that the photographer doesn't win by default the rights to the photograph either, because the photographer did not snap the picture. So it's more like the copyright in this did not exist um, itself. Um, and there was other, some other 
backdoor settlements, trying to figure out how to still take the revenue that this brought in and do good with it, both for the zoo as well as for the photographer. So there was some other um, uh, settlements, but anyway, that's what happened with Naruto. All right, let's talk about originality. So, so far we talked about uh, works of authorship and we keep saying original works of authorship. So what is an original work of authorship? Original work of authorship is really um, illuminated by this important case was a Supreme Court case, Feist versus Rural Telephone Service. Another fun story, so let's get right into it. Rural Little Telephone Service in, I wanna say Nebraska or Idaho, um, goes around and collects a list of all of its subscribers' phone numbers. Literally goes around and knocks on people's doors and ask them, you know, do you have our phone? Do you use us as your phone carrier? Great, uh, can we have your name and your phone number? And then they go back and they basically create Think of it as um, <clears throat> yellow pages, um, a subscriber list that they could share around. If you wanted to know, I need to call so and so, you can look it up and figure out what his phone number is and call them. Well, Feist is a sort of business model is to go around and gobble up all these little white pages, or sorry, yellow pages, um, these directories, and then create a larger sort of yellow page publication. That's not just for a town, but could be for a larger region, maybe encompassing multiple towns, maybe even a few cities. And therefore, this is good for them because they get to then charge more marketing uh, and advertising for a plumber who's a few towns over but wants to make sure that his advertising gets in front of people, uh, not just in his local area, but some of his regional area. So it lets them create more revenue by allowing folks to buy ads from a wider geographical footprint. So Feist asked Rural to use their directory. Rural says, thanks, but no thanks. We're not interested in being part of your money-making ploy. Well, Feist decides to just copy their directory anyway. Without permission, they just reprint it verbatim in their directory. This angers Rural Telephone Service and lawsuits ensue. Lawsuits that go all the way up to the Supreme Court. So. Rural argues, hey, this was our sweat of the brow. Remember John Locke? There's no right for this company to come swooping in and just take our property without permission. And they argue, among other things, that you know, they, they are doing a service for their you know, subscribers, things like that. So uh, the Supreme Court, after uh, examining and hearing both arguments, comes down with a decision that unfortunately is not very helpful for Rural, the little guy, the underdog, um, and says, we uh, agree with your arguments, um, little rural telephone service, but nonetheless, what you did by creating your list was put sort of last name, first name, your town, and your telephone number. And they said, this is really just a list of facts. This is just what you would do if you were creating any phone list. There's no originality here. This is just like kind of like creating an almanac that says, here's the day and the temperature uh, of the day. And we know from a previous slide, facts are never protected under copyright. They cannot be. So they lose, not because they were in the wrong and not because Feist wasn't a bad actor. They lose because they decide that their subscriber list never had a copyright bestowed onto it in the first place because it was not original. And so if there's no copyright, there cannot be copyright infringement. So Feist did win that case. But it taught us an important lesson. We now know that there is some small bar of originality required. It cannot be, um, it's not a very high bar, but it does exist. Think of it almost like a very small, you know, you move your foot and you hit a little bit of a thing on the ground. You got to lift your foot up, even if you only lift your foot up very slightly to avoid tripping, you still have to do it. Well, that's kind of like the modicum of originality. Their originality is really, really low to the floor, but you do have to lift your foot up a little bit. It's not just going to be a smooth, straightforward step. And so novelty and importance don't really matter. So we're not talking again, Shakespeare has originality, but my notes, no matter how crude or humble are, are not, no. What matters is, is it original to you? Are you expressing something? Because if you're not expressing something, then there's really no originality. If you're just recording something you see, like an observation, that's not really an expression. That's just a fact. 
And so it's it's through the expression. That's the really part that we want to emphasize. That's what's original to you. That's what your brain is telling you matters. And that's what the copyright is trying to protect. So if the back to rural, if the, rather than just do last name, first name, town and telephone number, that's kind of obvious. What if they did, you know, last name, first name, town, favorite rock band, telephone number, right? That might be enough to now cross the threshold of originality because there's no reason to, you know, record their favorite rock band. You know, the only reason to do that is if you were kind of being somewhat cheeky or clever, or you really were, in, you know, interested in creating a database of people's favorite rock bands. And that's, that's original. That's not a fact. So there is a, there is a small threshold of originality, but more often than not, it's not going to really be triggered because um, most things are going to be, most things are going to qualify over the hurdle of originality. So we know facts are not protected. We also know compilations of facts can be protected. So back to our almanac, I can't necessarily protect the fact that what's today's date and what's today's temperature, or maybe even the date and temperature that go back a hundred years. That sounds like an almanac. But I do know that the Farmer's Almanac or a Yellow Page is a copyrighted work. How so? Well, it's because the way you choose to compile those facts, to present those facts, to arrange those facts, that represents an original expression. If you ever actually look at an almanac, they do a pretty good job of figuring out how to arrange those facts. It's not just a database of, of rote facts. And that's what allows it to be protected. And that's why yellow pages and almanacs and things like that do have a copyright notice if you actually bother to look. Now, this also is a nice segue into thinking about the question of data. Because what exactly is data? Isn't data on some level just an observation a recording of a fact in group form? And when do we know if, you know, if we're dealing with the copyright of a data or just kind of a free sort of rural, you know, telephone directory of a data? And so understanding the, how this matters to data is an important thread in the story of intellectual property. So here's just a standard SQL table, right? Nothing really interesting about it. To me, this is kind of akin to last name, first name, town, and telephone number. You could think of um, a sensor that might you know, record the temperature on Mars and the rover. Um, again, those sort of telemetry readings, in and of themselves, not very interesting. They're just pieces of you know, numbers in a chart. So is that kind of data protected? Is that copyright protected? Now look at this. This is a slightly different database, right? This database shows a different set of information arranged in a different way with different connections between the data tables. This is a database schema and allows you to kind of think as an architect, how you can kind of assemble these different pieces or pockets of data to get different information out of it, uh, perhaps at a, uh, a more interesting um, level than just an SQL table. Is this protected under copyright? Is this sort of showing expression along the lines we've been discussing? Uh, I would argue, perhaps. The question is always gonna be, it depends. There really is no black and white answer, but I would certainly feel stronger arguing this case uh, for it being copyright protected than this case. So when it comes to data and copyrights, the story is not so, black and white. And all I'm talking about right now is kind of like the easy data that's like sensor data or numerical data. When we start thinking about data as, you know, higher levels of data like video or, you know, auditory expressions that kind of train machine learning algorithms or medical records and patient data and protected and confidential information or, you know, x-ray charts and CT scans, mammograms, you can understand how the question of what exactly is being protected becomes a very high stakes answer. And in some situations, data will not even be uh, relied on as copyright in order to do the contracting. They'll rely on it as just information that I possess. And so you might need a data transfer agreement, as in I own this information, you want it, you're going to agree to my terms to get it, regardless of the whether or not it's protected under copyright or not. 
So then it becomes a matter of contract law as opposed to a matter of copyright law. Some companies don't even bother trying to protect data outwardly. They just keep it all as a trade secret. And as a trade secret, of course, then no one has rights to uh, sort of look around or poke or even bring it into court to question whether or not it can be copied. So data is um, often not subject to copyright because of the Feist case. Um, there are exceptions when you compile it or when you kind of create an expressive schema. Trade secrets are often one way that we can protect data. This option is not so attractive for universities because MIT and Duke are really not allowed to have trade secrets. We publish all of our information, dissemination of knowledge is always our primary mission. So having trade secrets as a university doesn't always hold, but works fine if you're a Google or a Microsoft or an Apple. Um, we would tend to rely on a material or tangible property agreement, AKA a data use agreement, um, which basically is just a contractual agreement to move the data back and forth between parties. And again, the, this all becomes very, very relevant, especially today as we use more and more um, hundreds, if not thousands, if not millions of pieces of data to train machine learning models and to do pattern matching AI. So um, the data will often be, it's not just data, it's sort of myriad data, different levels of data, sensor data combined with patient data, combined with um, conclusions and charts about what are the um, inferences and, and observations of that data all being combined. And then on top of that, regulatory like GDPR and uh, PII restrictions make it even more interesting. Probably the subject of its own IAP. So we'll have to unpack that um, in a separate uh, course. All right, let's get in a little bit about uh, software. So machine code, machine code, the bits, the binaries that run sort of our um, computer chips. Think of the end of the matrix where Neo finally sees the world as it truly is, a bunch of zeros and ones instead of walls and floors and people. Um, machine code, obviously, is kind of a, a very unique type of uh, language. We don't really work well with machine code because could you imagine looking at this slide and figuring out where we made a mistake uh, and therefore have to correct the code? You know, which which one or zero is is off in this sequence. So what what programmers tend to do is write in uh, something that's a little bit more familiar source code. And source code kind of resembles language um, and has a certain logic behind it. And if you're skilled in writing source code, you get very good at sort of seeing how a program is built and look for errors and how to sort of um, uh, bug proof it and things of that sort. So the question is, uh, you know, there's the source code version. Uh, is source code sort of, where does source code fit in the copyright world? Um, you know, how do we protect software innovations in the country? And so we have this like essay on the left and the source code on the right. And the question is, are they the same? Because uh, if they're the same, then it's easy because we know the one on the left is protected. That's just sort of a piece of literature. So let's, let's apply our equation. Uh, is source code original? And I would argue, absolutely. Anyone that's ever written or tried to write code understands that it's a very original exercise and no two programmers will necessarily write the same code even if they're given the same um, functional objective or goal to meet. Is it a work of authorship? Well, let's punt on that one because that's the question we're trying to answer. And is it fixed in a tangible medium of expression? Yes. That answer is yes, you're looking at it, right? I can print out source code on a piece of paper, just like I can my essay, or I could save it into a RAM or ROM or cache or hard drive or um, you know solid state disk or spinning magnetic disk. So certainly fixable. So then the question is, is it is it considered one of the works of authorship that Congress wants to keep as a copyright? And it turns out the answer to that is yes. And so much so that Congress actually amended the Copyright Act in 1976 to include a computer program as part of the literature 
uh, works of authorship, the first one, number one. So object code and source code is a literary work protected from unauthorized copying um, in its form. So computer programs are in fact literary works protected under copyright, and they go through the same analysis as all types of other um, types of works. All right, so now let's talk about the last component, a tangible medium of expression. Copyright exists in original, we talked about, works of authorship we've talked about. Now we've got to close the circuit for mediums of expression. A medium, as you might guess, means what you think it means. Traditional media include things like paper. If you're writing notes down with a pen, then that is your fixation. If you are an artist and you're painting on a canvas, then your painting becomes the fixation and so on and so forth. So traditional media count for fixation, but non-traditional media equally count for fixation. And what we mean by non-traditional media are electronic media or media in the cloud. So machines and databases and servers and networks and RAM and ROM and all the other new database technologies, solid state or old school spinning uh, magnets, these all count as things where information can be fixed and retrieved. And that's really the key. So Congress was in a sort of unusual act of um, foresight. Congress actually in the original definition said, hey, when it comes to medium, you don't have to keep kind of waiting for us to update the list because technology is gonna advance way faster than we can keep up. So we'll say that media include things now known or later developed as long as they help with perception, reproduction, or communication of information. If they can do that either with a machine or device, then they're in. And so mediums, think of old school mediums, think of very futuristic mediums. Copyright's covered under all of those. All right, so let's have a quick test to see who's following along and who's not glazed over so far. Here we have this, um, uh, iron bar that's bent in a squiggly line. And my question to you is, you know, does this iron bar bent in a squiggly line constitute a copyright protected work or not? And I'm gonna make two different arguments. One argument is we know that copyrights can't be functional. If you recall on that previous slide, it was listed right after ideas and facts. Things that are functional cannot be protected under copyright. This looks pretty functional. Right now it's being used as a bike rack. And so if I'm locking up my bike to it, it seems like it's performing its function to prevent my bike from getting stolen. So that would seem to argue it's not a copyright. But let's take the bikes away in your mind's eye and just let's look at it as a squiggly bar. Isn't a squiggly bar, is a squiggly bar on its own a copyrighted work? Well, we also learned that art's protected under copyright, and I've certainly seen modern art that looks like that. You know, you take a piece of bar and move it around and bend it, and voila, you have a piece of art. Who am I to say otherwise? So if it's art, it should be protected under copyright. If it's functional, it should not be protected under copyright. Here we have something that posits itself at both at the same time. What gives? What's the answer? And so when we have a situation like this, where it's almost too difficult to uh, separate the idea of this bike rack and the expression of it as a sort of metal bar, we call this merger doctrine. Um, and when we say that the idea and its expression have merged, it's very difficult to then give it a copyright. Because again, ideas are never protected, only their expression. And when you have the idea and its expression kind of almost inseparably fused, you really can't pull them apart. So this is called merger doctrine in copyrights. And it comes up in a few other places besides this bike rack. It comes up in recipes or how to's, right? If you write a recipe for baking a cake and you say, I crack an egg and I mix it with batter and I put it in the oven at 350 for 40 minutes or whatever, and out comes the cake, that recipe is really kind of just a set of instructions. It's functional language. There's not really expression. It's just telling you how to bake the cake, telling you what to do and how to, how to build a deck or how to paint a fence or 
in some cases, the old sweepstakes that used to come in cereal boxes, print your name on a self-addressed stamped envelope and send it into the company, right? When you have certain things that are almost impossible to say a different way, you have this merger doctrine sweeping in. And when there's merger doctrine, there's no real copyright there. So what I'm gonna tell you, believe it or not, is that recipes are never protected under copyright. So cooking books are, you know, have lots of recipes. Are you telling me, Dan, that no cookbook has a copyright? Because I think you're wrong, because every time I go into a bookstore, for those of you who still go into bookstores, they're coming back into fashion. I see them more and more. Um, you see a lot of cookbooks. They're oftentimes one of the best-selling things on the shelves of a bookstore are cookbooks. So how are these cookbooks selling and making money if they're not copyright protected or public domain? Well, let's look at a cookbook a little bit more carefully. What do you often get when you look at a cookbook? It's usually the, my old family's recipes from the old country or when I went backpacking in Europe after college and I discovered the wonderful cuisine of Southern Portugal. And what you're really seeing is the expression of the author being imbued with the recipes side by side, maybe not side by side, sometimes up front and then the recipe follows. But nonetheless, what they're doing, and that's not just because they're being nostalgic or being, you know, clever, I mean, being creative, they're being clever. They want to imbue the expression because that's what's gonna allow them to own the copyright in the book. So it's not just, oh, my grandmother has great uh, recipes for making sauce from the old country. It's when I talk about this in my book and I talk about how my grandmother passed down this recipe and where they came from and how we used to get together on holidays, all of that is the original expression that's copyright protected. When I finally get down to crack an egg, put it in the oven at 350 for 45 minutes, that part I can't protect. That's just merger doctrine. So, but if I kind of bake it all in, no pun intended, um, with my original expression, it gets harder to, uh, to plagiarize. And so that's why cookbooks have copyrights, at least in the content, that's not the recipe. When you get to the recipe, feel free to steal that part out of a cookbook. No one's gonna bother you. Okay. So let's talk about what we've talked about, what a copyright is, what the rights are, all the ingredients of a copyright. What about infringing a copyright? What does this all matter? When someone is going to actually enforce their copyright and claim that you're copying them, you need to basically show two things. One is access and two is substantive similarity. So if you, if you have access to the work, you can't copy the work if you don't have access to the work, right? Think back to grade school, you know, kindergarten, first grade, second grade, you didn't study for your quiz. You're peeking over the shoulder of the person next to you because, you know, you want to understand what their answers are, right? If they're not there, if you're taking that quiz in, you know, isolation, there's no other shoulder to look over, you can't copy. So you need to have access to the other work in order for you to copy. It's a social, right? It takes two to tango. So that's why you actually have to prove access first. Once you prove access, then you have to also prove that your work that you created is substantively similar to the other work. Um, otherwise, it's going to be hard to show that you're copying. We have to do this all in the context of knowing that independent creation is allowed. You can actually create two works that are very similar as long as you can prove that you were independently creating them. If there's no copying, then there's no copyright infringement. In fact, a judge once said if two people were to write the same poem but be separated in caves unknowing each other, and they wrote the same exact poem verbatim, both poems would have independent copyrights and not be copies because they did it in a cave without knowing each other. I mean, now that's a philosophical abstract argument. In the real world, you'd probably show that verbatim is proof of direct copying because, you know, the world is different and things, information flows around more freely now. But philosophically, independent creation is always allowed. This means if you want to create a copyrighted work that is very, very similar to someone else, all you have to do is hire people to do something very similar and not give them access to the original work. This happens all the time in software. We call it clean room coding. So someone else has a program, you want to copy it, you hire a bunch of programmers and you give them the sort of goals, you give them the functions, you give them 
you know, essentially your spec, but you don't give them any access to look at what else people have done to get there. And you turn them loose in isolation and whatever they come up with um, is going to be its own independent copyrighted software. Even if it, at the end of the day, does something exactly the same as the thing you were trying to compete against. No access, no copying. You could also copy very, you could also copy little bits called de minimis copying is allowed. Like if you just take a very, really, really small amount of something, not going to be in trouble with that. There's, there's also a concept of unconscious copying. You can accidentally copy something without even trying to. Um, and this is a concept that is sort of understood, particularly troublesome for software writers, because they might read some code and it gets lodged in their brain and then somewhere else comes out. And it's very similar. They have to worry about that. And musicians also worry about this. In fact, there was an important case that involved George Harrison, the Beatle, who um, wrote a song called My Sweet Lord. And My Sweet Lord, the melody was awfully similar to an earlier Motown song called He's So Fine by the Chiffons. And a judge ruled against George Harrison, who was a Beatle, and very, very, you know, no one would ever accuse George Harrison of having to borrow ideas to be successful, right? The Beatles, after all. Um, but nonetheless, he would, had access to a Motown song, which played along the radio and everywhere. And he came up with a song many, many years later that happened to overlap and have a very similar theme and melody. And he was found guilty of copying that copyright, even though the judge pretty much agreed that George Harrison didn't do it on purpose, that he was sort of subconsciously copying, but it didn't matter for the defense that that was not his intent. All right, now, quick note on the distinction between copyright infringement and plagiarism, because there are a lot of folks in the room that are coming from an academic setting, and I want to make sure you understand the difference. Plagiarism is an academic infraction. Plagiarism is passing off other people's ideas as your own uh, without giving proper credit. Infringement is a legal infraction. Copyright infringement is borrowing chunks of someone else's work without permission or without license. It's completely agnostic to whether you cited them in your bibliography or your footnotes or your endnotes. Put another way, you could not ever defend yourself in a legal copyright infringement case by saying, but your honor, I, 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 I said exactly where I took the book from. I gave the author credit. It's not my book, but I still reproduced the entirety of their book in my work. No, that's not going to get you out of that case. So plagiarism, taking someone else's kind of ideas or property, um, taking their ideas and passing them off as your own without really giving that other person credit, uh, as opposed to taking someone's property without permission. Two different things. All right, so now let's get into the case that is kind of juicy because when when you take someone else's work, it's kind of obvious. But when you borrow someone's work and you create something that's not exactly a verbatim copy, then it gets interesting. So this is where we're going to talk about non-literal infringement and how to deal with non-literal infringement. So when you have non-literal infringement, when you're not actually directly copying, but you're borrowing, the question is how much borrowing is OK, um, right? And this is not an easy case to solve because it's subjective. What might be clear-cut um, infringement to some party might be an appropriate amount of borrowing to another party. So how do we make sense of this? And how does a court get to sort of adjudicate these cases in an objective and clear and consistent manner? Well, one of the tests that they use can relies itself on what we call levels of abstraction. And the way to think about levels of abstraction is you break down the work into kind of like a sort of 50,000 foot airplane view, and then a much lower altitude view where you see even more details. And then a very, very sort of low, almost to the ground view of the work where you're looking at lots of details and seeing all of the sort of uh, things that matter about a work. And when you apply what's called the abstraction filtration and comparison test at these various levels, it should allow you to understand exactly what's okay to take and what's not okay to take. So for example, 
you might be interested in writing a story about wizards. You might even be interested in writing a story about boy wizards. Does that mean that you are not allowed to write a novel about a boy wizard because J.K. Rowling wrote Harry Potter? Absolutely not. Because at the highest level of abstraction, a story about a wizard is not owned by anyone. And the story about a boy wizard is not owned by anyone, right? So we're still kind of doing fine. And even when we get to a lower level of abstraction, even if both stories have things like wizards robes and black cats and wizard school and um, wands, magic wands and potions and cauldrons, all of those things don't prove that you're stealing or borrowing from Harry Potter because they're common elements, they're public domain elements. These are stock characters, they call them sens affair in those types of stories. No one's allowed to own those. So we're still operating at a level of abstraction where even though these things exist in both works, it's not infringement. But as we start to get to maybe the lowest level of abstraction, where we're learning about character names and character identities and relationships of characters to each other, then are we borrowing too much? Is your story about a boy wizard named Barry Porter who goes to Logwarts? You know, now you might be saying, okay, these folks are borrowing a little bit too much. They're, they're Trace being a little too close to J.K. Rowling's property, and they're clearly just trying to make a quick buck by selling a story that's kind of a knockoff of Harry Potter. And so at that low level, you could start to compare and make sure what you're seeing is not a, a, a ripoff or an infringement of the other property. But before that, just because all those common elements existed is not in and of itself damning. So uh, here's a, here is a test to see how we can apply that last slide. Real world test. On the left, famous New Yorker cover, Saul Steinberg, the artist, uh, came up with the cover of New Yorker, the myopic view of New Yorker's view of the world, right? It's kind of a, now it's kind of cliche, but back then it was a new con a new concept to the art world. And clearly the artist is trying to say that New Yorkers have an inflated sense of self. Everything in Manhattan is the only thing in the universe that matters. You know, our streets, our buildings, our cars, they're up in the forefront, they're life-sized. And then of course, everything else that is happening outside of New York is inconsequential, right? The rest of the country is a carpet with a couple of small bumps and blips along the way. And then these nondescript pieces of land out there in the Pacific, like Japan, China, and Russia, right? You get the joke, you get the art. So now Moscow and the Hudson is a movie poster that comes out some years after, and they want to kind of play on that theme. So what you see in the Robin Williams movie is essentially, you know, a similar theme. There's Manhattan, because he goes to Manhattan in the movie to defect. And obviously he's from, at the time, Soviet Union. So there's Moscow and the Red Square featured in the background. But there's thematic elements that are common with Saul Steinberg, like London is this nondescript um, kind of blip in the ocean. And then there's the Eiffel Tower. And, you know, I don't know why they have a Leaning Tower piece next to Rome, but anyway. Um, nonetheless, that, that's the concept there. So the question is, is the movie poster infringing on the New Yorker cover, uh, the artist, the copyright in the New Yorker cover? And this was a case that went to court. Now, let's look at our levels of abstraction case. At the highest level, nobody owns the concept or a monopoly on wanting to talk about like the, you know, geography or thinking about like views of Manhattan overlooking the world. And these are not even identical. One is looking west over the Pacific. This one's looking east over the Atlantic. So they're not even a true copy in that sense. But you could see some common elements there. Like the, the buildings kind of have some overlap. The, this, this building over here on the right side of the street looks a little bit like this building over here on the right side of the street in the poster. There are some similar cars some similar lamppost, but let's look at the stock characters. Aren't, aren't, if you're gonna draw a picture of Manhattan, you're gonna have to have buildings, you're gonna have to have cars, you're gonna have lampposts, you're gonna have water towers on top of tenements. That's kind of comes with the territory when you're thinking about New York. So the, the fact that these both exist in, in each 
mean it's a smoking gun infringement? Um, probably not. So the question becomes, you know, is this movie poster infringing the copyright or is it more like homage? And in a free society, do we want to encourage kind of the creation of new works that are evocative of earlier works that inspire us and therefore the public benefits from new works? Or do we want to kind of crack down on this and say, no, you never bother to get permission or a license from the New Yorker or Saul Steinberg, therefore you should never have created this poster to begin with? Well, it turns out that the answer to the question was, drum roll, guilty of infringement. And I know you're surprised by that because I've set it up to be kind of a slam dunk for non-infringement, but they were found guilty of infringement. And one of the reasons they were found guilty of infringement, although they agreed it was probably homage, was, well, A, they knew that the, you know, they admitted they had access to the Saul Steinberg work. And they knew they were trying to emulate it on purpose. The question was, did they emulate too much? And although there's nuances that are distinct in both, there are also things that don't need to be borrowed unnecessarily. Like, let's look at the font in the New Yorker. Look at the W in the new, look at the W in Moscow. They borrowed the same font for the movie poster that was really unnecessary and not even part of Saul Steinberg's art. That was really just how the New Yorker writes itself. And so, it clearly, I think the courts were saying, borrowed a little bit too much. So unfortunately, they were found guilty of infringement. Curiously, if this case were tried today, they'd have a whole different strategy for, they'd probably call it um, a parody of the original poster and parody gets special consideration as we'll see in a second. So, so far I've been talking about things to do to infringe fair use, I think it's important that we also talk a little bit about the fair use limitations. Fair use limitations are the things that we do in a work to obviously safeguard against uh, appropriation. And so it's fair use if we're using a work to for the purpose of criticism, for commenting, for news reporting, and for scholarship and research. Um, and so these are the fair use factors that we have to deploy whenever we're adjudicating whether something is fair use or not the purpose and character, the nature of the copyrighted work, the amount of the portion used and the effect upon the potential market. So in another sort of interesting fair use case, when um, the Watergate scandal happened and, and Richard Nixon resigned, Gerald Ford came in as president and, and finished up the term. And as most presidents do, they write a memoir of their time in office. And Gerald Ford was no different. He wrote a memoir of his time in office and on the eve of his book going to um, um, to market, um, the the Nation magazine essentially printed a chapter of his book that had to do with Watergate scandal. So they did a little dumpster diving and they basically scooped a chapter of his book and printed it in their magazine before his book could hit the shelves. So this they sued the Nation for copyright infringement. And the nation argued a bunch of uh, legitimate defenses, like, you know, the president is a public figure and we have a right to report the news. Um, he's nonfiction, that the, um, you know, we only used less than 1% of the work, all the things that the fair use factors say you're allowed to do. Um, but it, it was all unpersuasive because the one factor they lost on was that they did gutted the potential market for the book by publishing the Watergate chapter. Put another way, nobody cared about Gerald Ford except for what he was doing with Watergate and his parting of Nixon. So nobody really wanted to read the book other than for that chapter. So by publishing that chapter, it kind of destroyed the market. Therefore, it was ruled not fair use. So fair use is not a quantitative safe harbor. It's a qualitative exercise. But as I said, parity gets special consideration. So what are the remedies for copyright infringement? Injunctive relief, destruction of the infringing, you can get damages, actual potential. And this is why registering your copyright is important because you don't have to just prove damages. You're allowed to claim statutory damages, which can get pretty um, significant, up to 150,000 for a willful infringement per infraction. And in very, very rare cases, you can have criminal prosecution, like if you are illegally pirating copyrighted works. All right, a little bit of quick time on open source. 
So open source is a type of copyright license, and that's what you need to understand. Open source itself is not a name of a license, it's the name of a brand. So open source foundation publishes a list of license agreements, and here's a list of some of them, um, that have been approved by the open source initiative. They subscribe to the open source definition and therefore they're considered open source licenses. And if you're using one of these licenses, then you're allowed to claim you're using open source. But they're not the only game in town. There are other licenses that you can use that are not open source that effectively do similar things. But here's a very simple open source license. The MIT or BSD is license. This is it in its entirety. It's copyright notice, and then the essentially ability for you to um, do what you want with or without modification, provided you keep the copyright notice and don't use the name of the organization as a way of endorsing your products or your services. So it's kind of like an as is clause. And that's it. If you do those two things, you're in compliance with the MIT or BSD license. So it's a very effective way of getting lots of software programs out into the world with very little regulation and very little red tape to go through. Now, to contrast that, we have something like the GNU General Public License, which forces you to do lots more in order to use that code. It says, for example, that if you modify any code in GPL, you've got to then carry the notice of what you've changed. You've got to license it at no cost. And you've got to provide the corresponding source code of your change. So under a GPL license, it's kind of like getting infected with the flu. If you touch that code, then you have to use that same license, which means if you change it, you have to open source your changes. So it forces everybody in after you, everybody downstream, to play by the same rules and open source your code. And so that is sort of the opposite end of the spectrum where it's a very restrictive license and you better make sure you understand what you're doing with it and using it appropriately. Otherwise you might open source lots of proprietary code. Now there's also something called Creative Commons, which is sort of a version that's been created for non-software programs because you could have a textbook or lots of other types of works of authorship that you want to release to the public under certain terms and conditions. And so the Creative Commons uh, nonprofit organization provides a series of licenses a la carte for you to do so. Here's an example of one. This is a Creative Commons non-commercial attribution. And as you can imagine, the only things you have to do is agree not to make any money off of this particular work, no commercial advantage, no monetary compensation. And in the second paragraph, it's telling you how to credit or source the work that you are, in fact, maybe you repurposing, remixing, readapting. So you keep the copyright notice, you keep the name of the author, and you add a credit identifying you know, where the work came from, such as this is a French translation of a work by original author blank, or this is a screenplay based on original work by author blank. And as long as you provide that attribution clause and you're not making money, then you're free to use that work with impunity and not be subject to any copyright um, infringement lawsuits. So quick word about software patents. So remember, copyright law protects expression, not functionality, but software is unique in that it has both functionality and expression. So what do we do when we want to protect something that is beyond just the source code, right? And that's really a problem because algorithms and software and other methods of doing business kind of all center around the idea, the function, and not necessarily its expression, right? Patents protect things like the cotton gin and industrial era inventions, that's pretty easy. That's what we think of when we think of a patent. But what about a software that's really just a flow chart of information? Yeses and nos. Isn't this kind of like trying to patent an idea? And didn't I argue earlier that you can't, you know, protect ideas in intellectual property? Well, yes. And this is why patenting software is kind of risky business. It's difficult to do, and you better make sure you have a pretty solid case for it before you engage in it. Because a computer process can be patented if it's tied to a machine or device, maybe not the cotton gin, but something like a mainframe or a system. If it's transformative, like a way of breaking down hydro, uh, rubber into sort of um, little molded rubber pieces, which was um, one of the Supreme Court cases that allowed patenting of software. Or if, it's some, if it adds something more than just the abstract idea. So now 
after Alice were always arguing that the software or the algorithm is doing something more than just sort of the abstract concept. And of course, that's an argument that your lawyers have to make. So software, uh, when it comes to software IP, the source and the machine code is covered by copyright, but it won't protect against you hiring an independent team to clean room code because that's independent creation and that's allowed. The functions of what your software is trying to do might be protected if you have an applied algorithm or a system systemic patent, but those are not going to be easy to get. And they're increasingly being targeted by um, the patent office as, as you know, fodder for rejection. But unfortunately, that whole saga is a story for another day and another IEP. So I'm going to close there and thank you for your time. Um, and I don't know if we have any time at all for questions, but um, yeah, I'll just yeah. sort of leave it there and see if we have any questions. If not, feel free to email me or I'll answer you guys privately.